The National Broadcasting Company presents The Big Show. The first half hour presented by the makers of Reynolds Aluminum, the Reynolds Metals Company, and starring the glamorous, unpredictable Tallulah Bankhead. <laughs> For the next hour and 30 minutes, you will be entertained by some of the biggest names in show business. Such bright stars as... Bob Carroll. Joan Davis. Vera Lynn. Jimmy Nelson. And Danny O'Day. Claude Rains. Herb Shiner. Meredith Wilson. And my name, darling, is Tallulah Bankhead. <laughs> Darlings, uh, here it is, New Year's Eve. It was a long party. <laughs> 1951 is over, and here is 1952. I suppose most of you are a year older. Ah, uh, not me. People say to me, now, how do you manage, darling, to stay so young? Well, that's no secret. Every year, I put a handful of numbers into a hat. Every New Year's Eve, I pull out a number. Whatever number comes out, that's my age. The trick, of course, is not to put in any numbers higher than 29. <laughs> well, now, darlings, this year I pulled another number out of the hat. Do you know how old I am? Seven and one eight. <laughs> <laughs> but I did make one really good resolution for the new year. I'm going to be more gracious to my guests on the big show. I'm going to be considerate and thoughtful and kind and always the lady. So starting this week, with such guests as Joan Davis. Well, starting next week, I'm going to be a lady. <laughs> but every week, I'm gracious to our darling sponsor, the Reynolds Metals Company. Thank you, Miss Bankhead. You know, we've talked about this being the age of aluminum, Reynolds aluminum. But perhaps the truth could better be stated the other way around. Aluminum is the metal of our age. Our high-speed, streamlined civilization has no place for excess weight. So light, strong aluminum belongs. Modern design demands the clean white metal that never rusts. The building industry wants all this and radiant heat reflection, too. The unique quality that makes Reynolds aluminum roofing and siding keep interiors cooler in summer, warmer in winter. The quality that makes Reynolds foil insulation ideal for any home. Foil, did we say? What other metal can make the wings of giant planes and the paper-thin packaging of your favorite foods. Only aluminum. And of course, we mean Reynolds aluminum. Well, darlings, some of our guests on the show this week are new to the big show listeners. So to play it safe, I ask all of our guests to fill out some brief biographies I also asked them to include their favorite funny stories. So here is our first guest, Joan Davis. She wrote this revolting little commentary. <laughs> uh, Davis, Joan. Born? Yes. Hair? Yes. Eyes? Yes. Favorite saying? Yes. Married? I knew my luck had run out. <laughs> Made my first professional appearance at the original colony. Did so well, they booked me in all the 13 colonies. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite story? Well, my favorite story is about the little bricklayer who went to work every morning at 8 o'clock. The whistle went, woo hoo He was right on the job, putting in the bricks, making the mortar, leveling it off, one brick, another brick. 12 o'clock, the whistle blew for lunch. woo hoo Runs over, picks up his lunchbox, opens it up, takes out a sandwich, unwraps it, takes one by the sandwich and says, ooh, how do you like that? Peanut butter. Throws the sandwich away. Next morning, same thing. Whistle blows, woo hoo He's on the job, putting in the brick, making the mortar, leveling it off, one brick, another brick. Whistle blows for lunch, woo hoo Runs over, picks up his lunchbox, opens it up, takes out a sandwich, unwraps it, takes one bite and says, ooh. How do you like that peanut butter? This goes on every day for a week. The whistle, woo-woo, the lunchbox, the sandwich, ooh, peanut butter. Well, finally, the man working next to him couldn't stand it anymore. He says to him, if you don't like peanut butter, why don't you have your wife make you another kind of sandwich? 
And the little guy says, what wife? I make it myself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Why does that producer always put her on the show all the time? What producer? I do it myself. Oh, well, next we have a new face on the show, Bob Carroll, one of our brightest new singing stars. Carol, Bob, pop singer. Mom, housewife. Ambition, to be another Bing Crosby. So far, I have uh, only one son, and uh, <laughs> he won't work. <laughs> and he's going on four already. Favorite story? A friend of mine went to take one of those civil service examinations to become a policeman. And he was doing very well till he came to the last question. The examiner asked him, what is the distance between New York and San Francisco? And my friend said, if that's gonna be my beat, to heck with the job. <laughs> well, our next guest is a young singer whom we've just imported from England. Her name is Vera Lynn, and this is what she wrote. <laughs> Lynn, Vera, born in the British Isles, a mother couldn't get a seat. <laughs> Since arriving in America this past week, I have already picked up many slang expressions such as Oh, you kid, two, three, skidoo. <laughs> Tell it to the mariners. The mariners? Press on, darling. And now you're cooking with petrol. <coughs> Favorite story. A chap walked into a chemist shop, drug shop, I believe you call it over here, and he said to the chemist, I beg your pardon, but do you handle fly paper? And the chemist said, yes, I do. And the chap said, well, wash your hands and fix me a tuna fish sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> oh, darling Vera, that's an hilarious story. <laughs> really, I didn't get it. <laughs> well, anyway, she is a marvelous singer. Well, our next guest to write his biography is Jimmy Nelson. He's a young, a new young ventriloquist. And I see his dummy partner, Danny O'Day, helped him write it. <laughs> Look who's calling who a dummy here. Wow! <laughs> please, please, Danny, please be quiet. Uh, Nelson, Jimmy. O'Day, Danny. Just stop it, Danny. Yes. Lived with my mother and father in Chicago until I went on the stage 11 years ago. My mother was a hickory. My father was an elf. <laughs> Till he went out one night and got lit and laid an ash of himself. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind, I wish you'd cut that out. Um, favorite story? Thank you, I'll be glad to. All right, go ahead. <laughs> well, this is a story about a lieutenant in the last war. He was expecting a visit from General Eisenhower. Well, he was pretty nervous about it, so every once in a while he ran out of the orderly room and he said to the car that's stationary, he said, uh, General Eisenhower, get here yet? Uh, the pilot said, no, sir. This went on three or four times. Each time he'd rush out, look at his watch, and say to the pilot, General Eisenhower, get here yet! <laughs> and each time the pilot said, no, sir. Finally, about a half hour later, a car drove up and a general got out. The pilot walked up to him and said, excuse me, sir, are you General Eisenhower? The general said, yes. The pilot said, <laughs> boy, are you going to get it from the lieutenant? Wow! <laughs> yes. And when that private found out what he had done, well, he's still running. As for the general, well, who knows, though? <laughs> and now I see our next guest is a fella from Indiana, Herb Schreiner. Schreiner, Herb, educated in Indiana. Never forget the day I left school. <laughs> Some fire. <laughs> I uh, ran away from home at 28. <laughs> so on a... Uh, on account of the weather, weather being sort of poor, in fact, I was the first one to notice it. Uh, I was out on the front porch one day trying to shake a pick out of a mandolin. <laughs> I saw a storm coming. Uh, I didn't see it coming, but a friend of mine blew past the house. <laughs> That's right, and as soon as I seen that fella, uh, I knew there was something going on because I knew him very well and he never came up that street as a rule. <laughs> Uh, favorite story is a story about a fellow in my hometown, a fellow named Eve. Noticed, uh, well, he'd been famous for his big beard, big, long, flowing beard, and uh, 
One of the boys standing in front of the barber shop one day saw Eve walking by with his beard blowing in the breeze. He says to the barber, you know, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if Eve ever shaved off that beard. He might turn out to be somebody we know. <laughs> well, our next guest is a distinguished actor of the theater and motion pictures, Mr. Claude Rains, and he had this to say. Rains, Claude. We're not acting before the camera or behind the footlights. I'm a dirt farmer. The farm is located in Chester County, PA, not very far removed from the genius belt, Bucks County. And this costs me plenty of bucks. <laughs> this appearance tonight on the big show is very important to me. It means 20 tons of fertilizer. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite story. It was during the war, the locale a defense factory. Every night, one of the workers came out with a wheelbarrow full of sawdust. The guard of the gate stopped him each time, sifted through the sawdust to see if he was taking anything he should not be taking. He never found a thing. Finally, after a couple of weeks of this, the guard, who was convinced the man was taking something, stopped him one night, and after sifting through the sawdust and still not finding anything, said, Look here, old man, you and I have been friends for many years. I'm sure you're stealing something, but I cannot figure out what it is. Now, you tell me what it is you're stealing, when you come out here with that wheelbarrow full of sawdust every night, I promise not to report you. What is it you're stealing? And the man replied, wheelbarrows. <laughs> Hi. I never uh, get in on these biographies, but this week I'm going to tell a little something about my life. I've got a little something written here on asbestos paper. <laughs> A Bankhead Tallulah, a real name, Didana Bankhead. I changed it to Tallulah because Didana is such a weird name. <laughs> As a child, I was precocious, impertinent, sarcastic, and vitriolic. Fortunately, I have outgrown all these traits. In my early teens, I was as, uh, athletically inclined and, and played baseball on the school team in Alabama. Alabama, honey child. I was voted the most valuable player. Well, this training came in handy when I arrived on Broadway and found so many producers who asked me to play ball with them. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite story? I'll tell you off the show, darling. <laughs> but right now, I think it's time for some music. Last summer, the big show went to Europe. One of the highlights of our stay in London was meeting both personally and professionally the wonderfully talented Vera Lynn, and here she is. <coughs> Miss Lynn is one of England's greatest singers, as was evidenced by her triumphant appearance recently at the London Palladium. After the tumultuous reception she got on our show over there, I made her promise to come to America with me, uh, with us, on the big show again. Well, tonight, that promise is fulfilled. Thank you, darling. With an assist by Meredith Wilson, the Big Show Oxford Chorus, here is Vera Lynn singing Cole Porter's haunting ballad, I Am Loved. Meredith, darling, if you please. Yesterday was a dull day. Yesterday. Wonderful. 
good thing to be able to say. So ring out the bell and let the trumpets blow. Young darling, come here, sweet. I want to talk to you. How is London since I was there last September? Oh, we're slowly recuperating. <laughs> now, Vera, that's not a very nice start if you want to cement relations between this nation and the mother-in-law country. <laughs> <laughs> oh, tell me, Vera, is this your first visit to America? Yes, it is, and I must say I find it all so confusing. Oh, do you, darling? What's confusing you, Vera? Well, for one thing, the money here is so different from English money. Oh, how different, darling? Well, the people here have it. <laughs> well, you just happen to come during the money season, darling. <laughs> the season ends March the 15th. <laughs> Money. What a country. Oh, well, you'll get used to it. And you never... Oh, you came over on the Queen Mary, didn't you? How was the crossing, darling? Rather rugged. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> oh, by the way, uh, Winston Churchill was on the Queen Mary, too, wasn't he? Did you meet him, darling? Well, as a matter of fact, I did. Oh, how wonderful. We, we were talking, and he told me he was feeling a little under the weather, and I had some wonderful pills, and he borrowed one for me. A couple of days later, he borrowed another one. He kept borrowing them all the way we were on the ship. Oh, getting into practice, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh... <laughs> well, darling, now I know you'll pardon me if I borrow a few minutes here for our sponsor, the darling Reynolds Metals Company, and I wonder if that aluminum wrap they talk about would be a good thing for keeping New Year's resolutions. They're so perishable. <laughs> <laughs> well, Miss Bankhead, among all the thousand and one uses of Reynolds wrap, I just don't find that one listed. You know, of course, that Reynolds wrap, the original and genuine, is the pure aluminum foil, especially made for food keeping, for cooking, for baking. It will keep your salad greens crisp. It's the quick, neat way to cover bowls, sealing the freshness in. 
It's the best way to wrap leftovers of any shape. You can reheat them right in the foil. And there's a whole new school of meat roasting developed by Reynolds Wrap. You just roast your chicken, turkey, or ham wrapped in this aluminum foil. It seals in the juices. You get less oven shrinkage, more flavor, more meat. No wonder so many women want more and more Reynolds Wrap. No wonder they keep looking for it, asking for it. Though they know that military demands for aluminum limit the supply. As one of America's great producers of aluminum, the Reynolds Metals Company assures you that an important goal of its expanding capacity is to bring you more Reynolds Wrap. That's a New Year's resolution to be kept. And now, darlings, we welcome to the big show an artist whose accustomed habitat is the big time. Behind him, years of devotion to and triumph in the theater of London and New York. A brilliant career in pictures and a last season success in the much discussed dramatization of Arthur Kessler's book, Darkness at Noon, Mr. Claude Rains. Claude and I are pleased to bring you now a dramatization of that sardonic little masterpiece by John Collier, Midnight Blue. Claude and I are Mr. and Mrs. Pierce. We have several younger children already off to school, an older son not up and dressed yet. His name is Fred. The scene, quite simply, is in our home in an English suburb. The time, that sensitive time, known as breakfast. But before breakfast, the story quite properly begins with the rival home of Mr. Spears in the wee hours of the morning. Late. Quite late. Too late. Try to give me away, eh? Try to raise the house. Well, you'll strike no more. You'll tick no more. Not tonight, anyway. Now then, it's all done, isn't it? Hat was right, overcoat, muffler. The right one? Mm-hmm. Poker dots. Shoes cleaned, shirt spotless, clothing in order and brushed. No uh, jewelry missing, no buttons gone, hands and face scrubbed, no bruises, no scratches, nothing. One must be careful. Sometimes they convict a man because of a thread, a piece of lint. But they are not infallible. There now. Everything is done. Snap out the light. Let your eyes get used to the dark. No stumbling. Easy now. Quietly, quietly, easy. Wait. Listen. She's asleep. Excellent. Easy now. Easy. There. And so, to bed. You haven't said good morning, dear. Haven't I? Well, you do intend to. No. Then I'll say it. I don't want to hear it. First of all, any fool can tell it's morning. Secondly, tell me one good thing about it, just one. No, on second thoughts, don't tell me. Oh, my, you are in a mood. Oh, never mind about my mood. You just see to it that my toast isn't burned for once. Uh, do you want your mood a soft boil? What? I, I mean your egg, darling. Speaking of egg, where is that son of yours? Oh, he's yours as much as mine. He must have overslept, I'll call him. Fred! Fred, darling, do you hear me? Get up this instant, Fred! I'm up. I'm up. You better hurry, you'll be late. I don't know what this family's coming to. Everyone out half the night. Oh, here's your toast. Who was out half the night? You, Fred, Millie. I don't know what time the children got home from that dance, but I know what time I got home. Well, I thought it was about three. Three nothing. I got home about one. That's odd. What's odd about it? Well, I heard the hall clock strike two. The children came in shortly after that. Then a long time after, the clock struck one. Then it sort of whirred or something, and, and then it didn't strike again. 
Well, this morning I found it had stopped. Look here, I distinctly said that I came home about one. Well, maybe one thirty. The clock was perfectly all right, and you, well, <laughs> you were asleep and snoring as usual. I don't snore, especially when I dream. Unless, of course, I dream that I'm snoring. And then I snore because I know that it's really uh, me snoring, not really me, you see. It's only in the dream. <laughs> oh, fascinating. Could I have some more coffee? Well, of course. Oh, by the way, dear, did Mr. Benskin give you a lift home last night? No. Oh, I don't. You asked. Will you give me that coffee? Well, going out to dinner is all right. I mean, a man ought to have an evening with his friends. But you should get your rest, you know. Uh, not that I had much rest last night. Oh, I had such a terrible dream. I dreamed that... If there is one thing I hate more than coffee in my saucer, do you see this mess? Well, really, dear, you, you are so brusquely for your coffee. And then when I was pouring, your hand seemed to jerk the cup. I and was I... saying that if I detest anything more than a filthy mess in my saucer... It is the sort of female who blathers out a dream at the breakfast table. Oh, my dream. <laughs> all right, my dear, if you don't want to hear it. It was all about you, that's all. Uh, will you pass me the Either question? tell your dream or don't tell it. Will you say you didn't want to hear it? There is no more disgusting or offensive sort of idiot than the woman who hatches up a mystery and then... Well, darling, there's no mystery. You said you didn't want... Will I mean... you please, will you kindly put an end to this and tell me very briefly whatever nonsense it was that you dreamed and let's have done with it? Imagine you're dictating a telegram. Very well. Mr. T. Spears, Normandy, Radcliffe Avenue, Western Garden Suburb. I dreamed that you were hung. Hanged. What did you say? Henry, there's something the matter. <laughs> you look as if you'd heard from the income tax people. Uh, why? Why was I hanged? Well, because of a murder in the middle of the night. It was so vivid, my dear, I... Oh, so. I committed a murder and I was hanged. Well, now that I'm out of the way and you can talk freely, do tell me the grisly details. Whom did I murder? Well, it, it really was grisly. I, I woke up quite depressed. It was poor Mr. Benskin. What? Yes, you murdered poor Mr. Benskin. So why you should murder your own partner, I don't know. Lovely. Lovely. You had me commit a murder, saw me hanged, and you didn't even go to the trial. Must have been a motive. Oh, there was. But it was rather vague. Something about, uh, well, about Mr. Benskin insisting on looking at the books of the firm. Something vague. People are hanged every day for something vague. Murder being so hard to explain. No, no, no. It was all quite clear, really. Oh, of course, yes. You're holding me spellbound. Uh, would you care to toy further with the horrible details? Well, my dear, you see, there uh, you were with Mr. Benskin... Uh, late at night, and he was running home in his car, and you were chatting about business. And, of course, you dreamed exactly of what we were speaking. <laughs> oh, well, you know how people can dream the most difficult talk about things they don't know anything about. And it sounds all right, and, of course, it's all nonsense, but it's the same with jokes. You dream you make up the best joke you ever heard, and when you wake up... You tell your husband the joke, and there is utter silence. <laughs> yes, it is a scream. Do go on with the dream. Well, my dear, you see, you were chatting and you drove right into the garage and it was so narrow that the doors of the car would only open on one side. And so you got out first and you said to him, wait a minute, and you tilted up the front seat of that little car of his and you got in the back where your coats and hats were. Oh, then we were driving without coats or hats. Yes, you see, because it was so unseasonably warm. Yeah, I see, I see. Well... Get on with it. I'm in the back seat now. Yes, there you are in the back seat with the hat and coat where Mr. Benskin still sat at the wheel. That was a, uh, uh, that dark overcoat he always wears and your light coat. You know, you wore yesterday in your silk muffler and your hats and everything. Uh, can't we um, get out of the gentleman's wear? It's getting a little boring back here. <laughs> oh, well, things uh, pick up in a minute. Uh, you picked up one of the mufflers. They both had white polka dots on them. I think he was wearing one like yours the last time he came to lunch on Sunday, wasn't he? Only his was dark blue. Well, anyway, you picked up the muffler, and you were talking to him as you tied a knot in it. And all of a sudden, you put it around his neck, and, and you strangled him. Really? And um, why did I do this dreadful thing? Well, the vague thing about his wanting to look at the books. Oh, yes. Yes, this is too much for me. Well, it was nearly too much for me, too. I, I was so upset in my dream. Well, then you got a piece of rope and tied it to the end of the scarf and then to the bar across the top of the garage 
So it looks as if he'd, as if he'd hang himself. How very extraordinary. Oh, yes, it was. It was so vivid, I can't tell you. And, th and then it got all mixed up, you know, as dreams do, and I kept on seeing you with that muffler on, and it, it kept on twisting about your neck, and, and then you were being tried, and they, they brought in the muffler. Only seeing it uh, by daylight, it was Mr. Benskin's, because it was dark blue. Only by the artificial light, it, it looked black. How very extraordinary. Oh, it's silly, of course, I know it's silly, but what you would have me tell you. I, uh, I wonder if it is so silly. As a matter of fact, I, I did ride home with Benskin last night. We had a very serious talk. Um, not to go into details, it happened I'd hit on something very <coughs> odd at the office. Well, I, I had it out with him. We sat talking quite a long time. Uh, maybe it was later than I thought when I got home. And when I, when I left him, do, do you know I had the most horrible premonition. I thought, that fellow's going to make away with himself. That's what I thought. I very nearly turned back. I, I, I felt like a... Well, I, I felt responsible. It's a, it's a serious business. I, I spoke to him very forcefully. You don't mean to say Mr. Benson's a fraud. I mean, we're not ruined. Oh, no, not, uh, not ruined. But there's been some pretty uh, deep dipping. Are you sure he's the one? He, he seems so honest. Well, he or I, and it wasn't well, you don't I. Think he's... You don't think he's hanged himself? Oh, heaven forbid, no. But uh, considering that feeling I had, well, perhaps that uh, dream of yours came just from that uh, feeling of mine. Oh, of course it's true. Rose Waterhouse dreamed of water when her brother was away sailing, but he wasn't round. Oh, well, there are thousands of such cases. They're generally wrong on all the details. <laughs> well, I hope so, indeed. Uh, for example, it happens we uh, both kept our coats on and our mufflers, too, all the time last night. The atmosphere was hardly intimate. Well, I should say not. Who would have thought that of Mr. Benskin? His wife, poor woman, would not have thought of it. I resolved to spare her. So whatever has happened or not happened, not one word, not one word from you and the children, not to anyone. You know nothing. A single word might lead to disgrace for the whole wretched family. Oh, yes, you're quite right, my dear, quite right. Oh, I'll see the children, don't you? Oh, here's Fred now. Morning, Mom. Morning, Governor. Good morning, darling. Uh, no time for breakfast. I'll just get the train by the skin of my teeth if I'm lucky. Say, uh, whose muffler is this, by the way? It's not yours, is it, Dad? This is, uh, dark blue. May I wear it? Why, what's the matter? What on earth's the matter? Come in, Fred. You don't have to worry about your train. Come in here and shut the door. Thank you, Claude Rains, darling. It's a stroke of luck to have you on our program. You know, I was brought up to touch wood for luck, but our darling sponsor has converted me. And now I know it's better luck to touch aluminum. Reynolds aluminum. <laughs> well, good for you, Miss Bankhead. You know, it's nice to touch bright, smooth, rust-proof Reynolds aluminum. And aluminum is non-magnetic. You don't get those little electric shocks when you touch it after walking across a rug. That's one reason why the plates around light switches on modern walls are now made of Reynolds aluminum. In an entirely different way, the men of our armed forces like to touch aluminum. Because this modern metal makes their equipment so much lighter and more efficient. As we meet their needs and expand toward full civilian supply, remember that competition is the power behind production and the pressure that keeps price down. And remember, too, that Reynolds brought competition into the aluminum industry. The Reynolds Metals Company, pioneers of progress through aluminum. And now, before I get back to you, Claude Rains, this is as good a time as any to ring my chimes. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.
The Big Show, Act Two. And here is Tallulah Bankhead with her distinguished guest, Mr. Claude Rain. And now, Claude, let's talk about your being a farmer. Just one moment, my good woman. Before we get into these little jollies that you bandy with your guests every week, I want to warn you that I am a steady listener to your program. I've heard it for two weeks now. <laughs> you call two weeks steady? Two years will be more like it. It seemed like two years. <laughs> And before we get involved in this interminable bickering in which you indulge with your guests, I would like to make it clearly, clear immediately, that I demand respect. Oh, yeah. In the first place, <laughs> in the first place, I am gracing your show by my very presence tonight. Oh, yeah. Secondly, I am very much your senior. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah? <laughs> To me, you are merely a beautiful and a very young actress. Oh, my darling Claude. <laughs> you must come on our show every week. <laughs> Who can use that much fertilizer? <laughs> now, do you wish to continue this banter along the lines I've laid out, or shall I leave? What do you mean, leave? I can have the truck back up now and go back to my farm. <laughs> Just a minute, Zeke. No farmer's gonna come on this show and tell me how to run it. No Yankee farmer. No English Yankee farmer. All right, so you were a big hit on Broadway in Darkness at Noon. Well, I could have been in that play. I had a run of the play contract. You could never replace me. <laughs> oh, I mean in the part that Kim Hunter played. I could have played her part. My dear woman, you would have been entirely unsuited for that part. My dear man, if Kim Hunter could play it, I could. And I'll prove it to you. Didn't Kim Hunter play in Streetcar Named Desire? So what? Well, wasn't the star of Streetcar Named Desire Jessica Tandy? Yes. And in the movie version of Streetcar Named Desire, didn't Vivian Lee play the lead? So? And didn't Vivian Lee play the lead in Scarlet O'Hara? Well? And who is Scarlet O'Hara? <laughs> I must say that being on this show is much different from being on my farm. Eggs there are laid early in the morning. <laughs> now look here, Claude, don't give me that bit about your gracing our stage with your presence. On this stage have trod such great stars and talent as Miss Ethel Barrymore, George Sanders, Olivia de Havilland, Dennis King, Lawrence Olivier, Vivian Lee, Charles Boyer, and uh, Joan Davis. John Davis, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Rains, may I present uh, Joan Davis? No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, why not, Mr. Rains? What are you doing, playing hard to get? <laughs> well, I'm pretty hard to take myself. <laughs> Darling, this is the Joan Davis. The Joan Davis. Well, now, what is a Joan Davis? <laughs> what is a Joan Davis? Well, it's, um, it's sort of a... Um, well, it's kind of flat on top. Uh, no, uh, flat on the bottom. Uh, well, uh, flat all over. No, that's false. It's kind of... <laughs> Well, if you're not too fussy, you could say it's a girl. Or uh, rather something like a... Am I getting warm? Not to me. Joan, darling, you're wasting your time. This man is interested only in acting. Well, I'm interested in a little action myself. <laughs> no, Joan, I said acting. Mr. Raines is interested in the theater and his farm. Oh, well, I don't care about the farm, but I certainly know all about the theater. Oh, really? May I have a program, miss? Here you are, ma'am, second and third seat in this row. <laughs> you see, Claude, she does know all about the theater. Oh, no, you tricked me into that. I mean an actress. <laughs> uh, this is an actress? Yes, this is. Did you ever see Midsummer's Night Dream? Romeo and Juliet? Twelfth Night? As you like it? Well, you're looking at a girl who saw those same four plays. <laughs> And I'll never forget the night I played in Romeo and Juliet when I did the balcony scene, the rafters shook. Really? Don't think it was easy playing Juliet and running up on the roof and shaking the rafters. <laughs> well, let's see how good an actress you are. All right. How's your enunciation? Now, you repeat after me. How? How? Now. Now. 
Brown. Brown. <laughs> Cow. Well, he's back to the farm again. <laughs> How does Joan strike you as an actress, Claude? Well, she's a. Uh, how shall I say it? She. Uh, well, I'm. I'm trying to be succinct. She does. Exactly. <laughs> As long as you're giving acting instructions and uh, talking about cows, uh, do you mind if I step in here somewhere? You, Herb Fryer. <laughs> uh, Herb, I want you to meet Miss Rain. Hello. How about now, brown cow? <laughs> Say, that's quite good. I can use you. Oh, in your new play, Claude? No, on my farm. <laughs> Young man, I was singularly impressed by your singularly unimpressive reading just now. Thank you. It was really nothing. Exactly. <laughs> well, it really doesn't make much difference what you, how you say those lines. You know, the cows can't tell a good actor from a bad one. Young man, is this your first professional appearance as an actor? No, I made my first public appearance back in Indiana. I was uh, in a little show in a drugstore window for about two weeks, and uh, <laughs> we were doing pretty good, and then I had to quit, and my corn healed up. <laughs> made his first appearance as Paul Bunyan. <laughs> well, uh, I've been hearing some marvelous things about your new TV show. Which do you like better, darling, television or radio? Well, uh, thanks, Miss Bankhead, for asking me, but I'll tell you, I like them both. I, uh, well, the folks back home aren't too crazy about me being on television as I thought they would be. They, uh, in fact, they favor radio quite a bit. Uh, they, uh, rather have me on the radio where we don't have to wear good clothes all the time. <laughs> it's kind of nice, though. I, uh... If you'd get on television, of course, Miss Bankhead, I think it would do a lot for it. I think they could, uh, in fact, they'd probably change it to Tallulah Vision. <laughs> but anyway, radio is kind of a nice thing. I, uh, I think it's going to be awful crowded for the next few weeks, so this uh, being an election year and all that, the politicians will be taking over, you know, and uh, candidates will be on there making speeches and calling each other names, and the uh, same names they've been calling each other all these years except uh, after those Washington investigations, why they'd probably be able to think of some new ones now. <laughs> but whatever names they call each other, they'll probably be right. <laughs> you know, uh, both parties get a very fair chance, though, in, in radio. You see, if a candidate gets on and he makes a speech, why then they got to give the opposite candidate the same amount of time to make a fool out of himself. <laughs> the deal works. But uh, I've never been... Uh, Oh, I, I used to listen to election returns all the time just to see what was going on. I'm kind of anxious to see how these are going to come out this year because, uh, well, they'll be all on the radio uh, November there. And I, uh, in fact, I heard the other day something interesting on the radio. MacArthur is staying over at the Waldorf. He's over there living where uh, Herbert Hoover lives and uh, the Duke of Windsor and uh, makes it pretty nice for the general. He's over there where there's an ex-president and an ex-king and he can kind of look him over and see which he'd rather be. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, uh, there's a lot of things uh, We'll be hearing all this political news But, you know, on the radio The thing that always struck me was so good about it You get the news every hour And uh, the only thing better than that Is back home We used to have a, a thing where we'd get the Little bit better service than that It was the party telephone Party line, you'd get news on there You know, it's a lot better than radio They On the radio, they'll, uh, a news commentator will come on And tell you who's been seen with who but on a party line, you can find out what they've been seen doing. <laughs> Much better deal, you know, and uh, around home, people didn't used to enjoy the radio. That's the thing that uh, I couldn't figure out why. And then we, uh, well, they didn't have any station for one thing, which uh, <laughs> was bad, but uh, the town was so small, we didn't get a station. We had, uh, in fact, that was about the smallest town I've ever run across. Uh, people was afraid to leave for fear they'd never find it. And <laughs> Right. Afraid you never get back. But uh, we had no radio at all. And then we was lucky. We finally got a station, and uh, we never would have got it if it hadn't been for a far-sighted fella. He, uh, in fact, uh, we wouldn't have got it at all if he hadn't been far-sighted. You see, he thought he was building it in another town. <laughs> never forget that fella, though. He he really in didn't intend to go into radio at all. He'd been around town there quite a bit. He used to be a doctor, and. Uh, Oh, I don't know. He had to give that up. He was kind of careless. <laughs> oh, uh, I mean, with him, the smallest operation would turn into a major undertaking. <laughs> it's true. Like the time he gave that fellow a blood transfusion, and it took three weeks. 
It was crazy. They found out that he had that little hose hooked to the fellow's other arm. <laughs> but he, uh, he gave up doctoring after a few mistakes, and uh, he, he didn't, but he didn't turn into a bum or anything. I give him a lot of credit. He, he went, oh, no. that's right. He went to work, and he started, uh, well, he, he would do anything for an honest dollar. If it was more than a dollar, he wasn't so fussy. He was just... Uh, <laughs> tell you what he started to do. He was a good talker, so he started selling cemetery lots. <laughs> That's right. And boy, he could sell them. He could sell... Well, he sold people the lots, and then he talked them into building houses on them. <laughs> oh, he'd tell them anything. He told them they could... He says, well, why not build? You can have everything but a seller. <laughs> oh, he was very quick. Well, anyways, he, uh, after he found out he could sell things to people, he, wouldn't, uh, he just wouldn't sit still. He wanted to get them all at once. So he thought, well, he'll, uh, he'll get on the radio and uh, put his own radio station up. And uh, we was a little bit afraid of radio for a long time back there. People was afraid maybe it might runt the hogs. You never know. Afraid it might spoil the crops. You can't tell. So uh, Anyways, he started out, and he got this little station, and it wasn't too powerful at first. It was just a, well, the fact is, if the wind was blowing, you couldn't even get the programs at all. It was just uh, <laughs> But uh, his station was so weak, you could just barely make out what they were saying. And you'd think that would ruin him, but it, it made his first sponsor. He got uh, sponsored by an outfit that made hearing aids. <laughs> uh, oh, he was a lucky fellow, I tell you, but... The trouble was, he didn't know where to, where to, he was going to, well, he had a sponsor, he didn't know where to put the station, he didn't, couldn't get a good location, he had uh, kind of a poor spot in town, he was uh, right underneath the skating rink and over a bowling alley. <laughs> well, you're right, he had to move, they made him uh, move, his commercials was annoying the bowlers. <laughs> so, uh, he didn't know where to go, and he finally got a little place for his station up next to a dentist, and... Uh, he didn't have any money for an antenna to uh, put up. That was what was holding the station back. But this, that's right. This, uh, what it was, the dentist had a great big tin tooth that hung outside for a sign. So he hooked onto that and used that for an aerial. That big tooth there. It was a pretty good deal, but uh, later on he got kind of, uh, well, he got a little bit of money, you know, and he, he thought, well, he'll show off and build a great big aerial. He built an aerial so high that the programs couldn't get down to the city there. <laughs> well, at first, he didn't have much in the way of programs. He had this, uh, well, he didn't have any programs, to be honest with you. At first, he just had uh, static. <laughs> but uh, the people was like they are with television sets. They're just glad to get anything on it, you know. <laughs> so uh, he... Uh, he got one program, though. Finally, he decided he'll do all the programs himself. One man band, and uh, he did a program called The Man on the Street. He stood there for quite a while, and nobody came by. <laughs> and, uh, no, but when he'd get them, when finally he'd get somebody, he could interview them. I mean, he could get them to talk. He had that little uh, gift of, uh, well, he'd get them drunk is what it was. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, just just when he uh, just when he got going, he had a sponsor, he had a program, and everything else. He got another bad setback. Somebody moved into town with an electric razor. <laughs> he couldn't hear a thing. But he's not quitting. I'll tell you, he's the kind of fellow that will fight back. And now he's he's out there, ready to strike back at him. He's raised some money, and he's going to buy the razor. <laughs> Well, I didn't want to get you folks all riled up here, so I'll go sit down for a while. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> As always, I'm proud of divinely hilarious. I love you, darling. Well, it's been some time since we've had some music on the show, and what better time than this moment to introduce a new singing star, Bob Carroll. For his selection tonight, Bob is going to sing his sensational record hit, My Concerto. Mary's darling, if you please. <laughs> My 
Darling, I want to talk to you I don't want to <laughs> You don't want to? Have you read your contract? It specifically states that when I call you, you come over uh, Have you read my contract? I signed it, Perry Como Yeah, I got news for you That's the way our check's going to be made out, too <laughs> uh, I'll be right over <laughs> That's better I knew I could make you say uncle All right, here I am, Uncle Tallulah Oh, dear <laughs> I always have trouble with these young, handsome singers Oh, I didn't mean to start any trouble It's just that uh, I find you uh, most irresistible No You uh, sort of bring out the tiger in me Would you want me to hold that tiger down? <laughs> Hey, Tallulah, go away. <laughs> Can't you see I got myself a P-I-G-E-O-N? A piggyon? <laughs> What's a piggyon? <laughs> go away. Oh, you want to be alone, Tallulah? That's the idea. Come on, Bob, she wants to be alone. <laughs> I don't want to. Don't wanna. Well, uh, matter of fact, I find you uh, most irresistible, Miss Davis. You uh, bring out the tiger in me. You just said that to me. Well, I'm a neurotic tiger. <laughs> well, I just love that song you sang, Bob. My concerto. Uh, Miss Davis, <laughs> uh, that's pronounced concerto. The C is pronounced. Who's in tight? <laughs> See, I didn't know that Did you know, Tallulah, that C is pronounced Ch Ch <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's my favorite song, Bob it, it brings back so many memories My concerto 
is a simple melody as simple as the way we met. <laughs> it's a little high. <laughs> Come to think of it, I was a little high myself when I met him. <laughs> yes, I, I'll never forget the way we met. I was on a vacation in Miami at the Coney Plaza Hotel. <laughs> he was a serviceman. I think he was a serviceman. He always came up through that entrance. <laughs> way through school, the Miami State Institute for the Bald. <laughs> he was studying to be a moron, <laughs> junior grade, and he only had two more years to go. And it was so simple the way we met. The minute I saw him, he grabbed me in my arms. <laughs> he held me close with all my might, <laughs> and I felt his hot breath close to my face. Please, I said. You're melting my nose jug. <laughs> and that afternoon, we became engaged. We went shopping for a ring. He was looking at the four carat rings. I was willing to settle for a one carat. We finally compromised on a two carat. And he was so happy when I slipped it on his finger. <laughs> and two years later, he was graduated from school. But he wanted to go on with his education. He wanted to go to high school. He didn't have any money. He had been going to grammar school under the GI Bill. <laughs> yeah, but, but I told him, I told him he had to start making money so we could get married. So he went to work, and in no time at all, he became a tycoon. He sold ties. <laughs> yeah, well, he didn't make much of a living, but I decided that a foreign hand was worth two in the bush. <laughs> Then we, we had our first quarrel. Yes, it, it was just a little quarrel. He shot me in the shoulder. <laughs> but we patched that up. <laughs> and a few days later, he started picking on me with a nice pick. <laughs> and such large chunks. <laughs> 20 cent pieces. <laughs> but we finally patched that up. Then one day he took me for a ride in his car. And while we were driving along, he told me to go sit in a rumble seat. I went and there was no rumble seat. <laughs> but I held on the rear bumper and I dragged along all behind. You know, <laughs> and, and you know that white line that runs up Fifth Avenue? It's not there anymore. <laughs> well, I couldn't patch that up. <laughs> and when you hear my song, you'll hear my heart. Thank you, Joan. <laughs> Thank you, darling, for your most sentimental song. It touched me deeply. Now, just sit down, if you can, while we go on to Act 3. But first, I want to take a moment to ring my silver anniversary chimes. Three chimes of silver. This is NBC, NBC the National NBC Broadcasting NBC. Company. This is The Big Show, Act 3. This portion brought to you by Chesterfield. Sound off for Chesterfield. Get something new, something no other cigarette has. Chesterfield mildness plus no unpleasant aftertaste. By Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. And by Dentine, the gum with breathtaking flavor. And Beeman's Pepsin, the gum that's great to chew and good for your digestion, too. Tallulah Bankhead will be here in a moment, but first, let's hear Bing Crosby sound off for Chesterfield. Sound off, sound off, sound off for Chesterfield. Come see 
Seattle to Buffalo, Chesterfields are on the go. More smokers are buying them every day from New Orleans to Santa Fe. Chesterfield, 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 Chesterfield. Chesterfield. Milder, 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 milder. Chesterfield. That's right. Yes, Chesterfield is something new. No other brand can offer you. Mildness plus, no aftertaste. No unpleasant aftertaste. Mildness plus, no aftertaste. Mildness plus, no aftertaste. No unpleasant aftertaste in Chesterfield. That's right. From smart nightclub to country store, the folks are buying them more and more. Go north, go south, go east, go west. It's Chesterfield you like the best. Here's what we want you to do. Right now. Yes, here's what we want you to do. Right now. Sound off. Go Chesterfield. Sound off. Go Chesterfield. Try a pack of Chesterfield. Do it. Today. And now here again is Tallulah Bankhead. Well, darlings, it's time for Boy Meets Girl on the big show, and they make beautiful music together. Vera Lynn and Bob Carroll have combined voices to give us the lovely ballad, It's All in the Game. Meredith, care to chaperone this young couple, darling, if you please? <laughs> to fall but it's all in the game all in the wonderful game that we know as love you have worked with him and your future's looking dim but these things your heart can rise above Once in a while he won't call But it's all in the game Soon he'll be there at your side With a sweet bouquet And he'll kiss and caress your waiting fingertips And your hearts will fly Your future's looking dim But these things Your heart can rise above Once in a while He won't call But it's all in the game Soon he'll be there at your side With a sweet and he'll kiss your lips and caress your waiting fingertips and your heart Much. And now we bring on another newcomer to our show. Here's a young man whose skill as a ventriloquist is truly amazing. He has taken a piece of wood and breathed life into it. The young man is Jimmy Nelson, and his partner is Danny O'Day. Front and center, Jimmy and Danny. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, Tallulah. Uh, Jimmy, I want to bid you welcome to the big show, and that does not include your partner whom I consider a precocious and impertinent young man. <laughs> Why do you say that, Tallulah? Because I always knock wood for luck. <laughs> I see. <laughs> All right, Nelson, are you going to stand there with my mouth open and not say anything to this girl, Burrow? 
Miss Carol Burrow. <laughs> Look, Danny, that's no way to talk about a woman of Miss Bankhead's stature. She's a stature? Yes. Where are the pigeons? No. <laughs> Stop that I'm awfully sorry, Miss Bankett I must apologize for Danny No, that's all right, darling I consider the source And what do you think is the source? Just whom do you think is the source, eh? Huh? <laughs> now, you leave me out of this uh, Well, I don't know why I should be in this thing alone If she's gonna hate me Why shouldn't she hate you, too? Say, that's right Jimmy, you're the one that's making him say these things. Now, you see, Miss Bankhead, I want to apologize to Mr. Nelson saying the things that I said to you that he said. Uh, uh, now, just a minute, darling. <laughs> Who's apologizing, you or Nelson? Well, I am. No, I am. Danny, will you keep quiet? I will if you will. Uh, now, look, darling, I'm getting a little confused here. Uh, let me have that, uh, boy. For once, I'd like to hear a fella say things I want to hear. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right, here, here, you can have it. Oh, now, okay. Now, what do I do now, darling? Well, you just put your hand right in back here. I see, like this, huh? <laughs> oh, such cold hands. <laughs> Quiet. You're not supposed to talk. I haven't said anything yet. Now, is this where I put my hand, darling? Right back here? Yes, that's right. That's I right. Right. Why don't you wear mittens? <laughs> that's cold, you know. Danny, please. Oh. Sit still, you blockhead <laughs> Now, I uh, put my hand back here, that's right <laughs> Oh, Miss Bankhead, does this mean we're engaged? <laughs> I've got you under my skin <laughs> Oh, darn it, I can't find the string now, Oh, here it is, now, 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 look, darling, do I pull this string here? If you do, my underwear's going on around <laughs> Where is it, baby? The string is, the string's up here. Hi. Well, I'm trying to find it. I'm trying to. Well, stop rousing, will you? <laughs> stop complaining. Because her hands are so cold. I did it again. You did it again. <laughs> oh, here, let me show you how to do that, Miss Bankhead. Let, let me have Danny back again. Nelson, go find your own girl. I'm beginning to like this. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me try it again. I know. I hold him like this, and, and I put my hand back here. Oh, here comes all icy fingers again. <laughs> <laughs> wow! No, I get it. That's it, that's it. Now you talk to him and he'll answer you. Oh, all right. Danny, darling. Danny, darling. Yes. Look into my eyes. <laughs> Who's operating your head? <laughs> Danny. <laughs> look, you all can see him. <laughs> down, boy, down. Da Danny. <laughs> darling, look at me, look at me. Yes. You're fascinating. Yes. Tell me that you love me. Tell me that I'm fascinating and that I'm the only woman in the world for you. Talk to me, Danny. Talk to me. Who wants to talk? Let's neck. Oh. <laughs> Jimmy, it doesn't work for me. I can't get him to say the things I want him to. Well, try the other hand, Tallulah. Yeah, try the other hand, please. This one's getting sweaty. <laughs> oh, give me the other hand. All right, here we are. Oh, it's colder than the other one. <laughs> now, now. Now you'll talk to me. Here we go. Hello, Danny. How are you? I'm fine, how are you? <laughs> and what do you think of Tallulah? I think she's the most glamorous and devastating woman in the world. Oh, Jimmy, it works. It works like magic. Yeah, black magic. So why you see things as up and down my side? <laughs> oh, this is fun. I do want to do it some more. But look, darling, just a moment. Will you hold on just a minute, Jimmy? While Ed Hurley takes a moment out to tell us about something that's on his mind. <laughs> If you suffer from pains of headaches, neuritis, or neuralgia, you should discover what many thousands have known for years, that Anison brings incredibly fast, effective relief. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Probably at some time you have received an envelope containing Anison tablets from your own physician or dentist. Thousands of people have been introduced to Anison this way. Try Anison yourself the next time you suffer from the pains of a headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. You'll be delighted at how quickly relief can come. Anison is spelled A-N-A-C-I-N. -A -A Your druggist has Anison in handy boxes of 12 and 30 tablets and economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100 for your medicine cabinet. Ask for Anison today. <laughs> Well, Danny, how do you like Tallulah? Isn't she great? She sure is. <laughs> it's going to be tough getting back to you and your hot little hands. <laughs> well, Danny, I guess, I'm guess, I guess you're glad... Watch that bridge. I'm sorry. <laughs> I guess you're glad you came to New York. How, how do you like New York? <laughs> California, here I come. Just a minute. Right. All right. Uh, please. Uh, 
I'm talking about New York. Oh, yes. Now, New York reminds me of... Way down in the Zori. Danny. Where are you? Danny, that's enough. Uh, For the last time, I'm trying to say that New York will always be to me like... Chicago, Chicago. That's enough. That toddling dog. All right. Huh? That'll do. Uh, I give up. What, what can I do to make you behave tonight? I've yelled at you until I'm blue in the face. Well, so I notice. It goes very well with your bloodshot eyes. <laughs> Is it a set? No, it's not. Uh, Look, I repeat, I've yelled, I've, I've argued, I've even pleaded with you. There's nothing left to do. Have you ever thought of money? (laughs) Just as I thought, broke again. What happened to the 50 cents you found yesterday? When I take a girl out, I go all the way. I thought so. (laughs) (laughs) Always spending money foolishly. What about the money I gave you today? Well, I... You don't have to tell me. I I can guess. It's probably been squandered. The same way the rest has been squandered. Now, come on. Huh? What did you do with the money I gave you today? I... I bought you a birthday present. Oh. Well, now you make me feel... You make me feel like a perfect idiot. Don't be silly. Nobody's perfect. Now cut that. (laughs) You're just trying to play on my emotions. If I want to spend money on my girlfriend, you can't stop me. Girlfriend? Yeah. Well, I'd like to know something about her. What do you want to know? Well, is she a pretty girl? Is she homely? Keep going. Well, don't tell me she's ugly. All right, I won't tell you. Is she ugly? Try repulsive. Repulsive? Know that you're getting warm. Look, I think you're kidding me. Besides, how long have you been interested in girls? Why do you see... Why? I said, how long have you been interested in girls? Ever since I found out they weren't boys, you jerk. You want to sit on my knee for a while? Oh. You know, sometimes, Buster, you talk like an imbecile. Like what? Just what I said, you talk like an imbecile, an imbecile. Well, I didn't understand what you meant. I just said th- those two words, and I'll say them again. Imbecile, imbecile. I beg your pardon, is someone calling me? All right, who left the door open? Gee, <laughs> who is this? This is Humphrey Higsby. Humphrey Higsby? Yes. Our other boy? Yes. Look, a schnuckle. His name is Humphrey. I call them the way I see them. <laughs> Look, uh, what are you doing here? I beg your pardon. I'm not getting through to him. <laughs> I said, what are you going to do? Oh, well, I, I thought that you, you and James and I might, uh, that is, I wondered if we, uh, that is, I, I thought that we did. <laughs> what was the question again, please? <laughs> What is he, AC or DC? <laughs> Whatever he is, he's not plugged in. I, I nearly thought that the three of us could, could do a song, that's all. You didn't let me finish my sentence, Daniel. Well, I'm sorry. After all, I was thoracotically through. Thoracotically through? <laughs> Executically. Oh, I see you. <laughs> well, go right ahead. Nobody's stopping you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, now then, uh, now it is. <laughs> If the ensemble is assembled, we shall begin. <laughs> well, you get a load of the figure on that guy Higsby. <laughs> I, I always wonder what they do with used Christmas trees. <laughs> now I know. Go ahead, three voices at once. Well, all know. It's all right. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, uh, here we go. No, M. M. No, he said M. No. He said M. No, M. No, T. M. No, T. M. No, T. T. M. No, T. T. Not. 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 M. No, T. T. Not. 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 R. R. I said R. He said R. 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 G. R. G. R. G. G. R. G. G. Greg. Greg. R. G. G. M. No, T. T. Greg. Not. Little Tony. Yara. 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 R. G. G. M. No, T. T. A. What did you say? I said A. B. A. D. Who? A. B. C. A. D. C. A. B. C. D. A. D. C D A D C D E A D C D E G H I I I said M O what M M M M M Shut up M O T T M O T T Not 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 M O T T Not 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 Right 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 not Oh,
Jimmy Nelson. Wonderful, darling. What a technique. Oh, if I could do that. How restful that must be, talking without moving your mouth. <laughs> and now here's something else of interest to you. For breathless moments, for your breathless moments. Chew Denti, the gum with <gasps> breathtaking flavor. Dentine tastes so good. Dentine freshens your breath. Dentine helps keep your teeth sparkling clean and white. Dentine, the gum with <gasps> breath taking flavor. Before you go out and always after eating, drinking, smoking, refresh your breath with dentine. You'll love dentine chewing gum, for dentine has a wonderful tingling, nippy flavor that lingers on and on. It's delicious. And remember, dentine helps keep your teeth white, too. Keep dentine handy. You'll enjoy refreshing your breath when you chew dentine. So for breathless moments, for your breathless moments. Chew dentine, the gum with <gasps> breathtaking flavor. Well, we haven't heard from the orchestra yet. Meredith Wilson and his boys, and my boys too, <laughs> have whipped up a special arrangement of a bouncy old favorite called Why. Meredith, darling, if you and the boys are ready, if you please. The question before the house is very serious. The question before the house is rather mysterious. Let's settle the question now before it can weary us. La do we when we want done, my darling. Come here, sweetie. I want to talk to you, Mary, dear. Yes, Miss Bankhead? Mary. <laughs> week after week, darling, your orchestra contributes a real high spot on the big show, and I just thought I'd like to tell you how very much we appreciate it. Please do. <laughs> I just did. Oh, well, in that case, thank you. Well, I must say you don't seem very happy about my compliments. Uh, well, sir, Miss Bankhead... We get back to that again You see, uh, there's one ambition that I've always had And that's to have a glee club just like Fred Waring With one of those uh, boing quartets Boing quartet? Yes, you know one of those quartets that at the end of every phrase The ladies go boing 
Well, why don't we have one on this show, huh? Oh, could we? Gee, sure. that'd be swell. Uh -huh. Now, uh, let's see who we got this week. We need four girls and a male soloist. Well, Claude Rains would be happy to oblige, I'm sure. Would you be the male soloist, Mr. Rain? Well, I'm the right gender. <laughs> Well, it's really very simple, Mr. Raines. How now, Brown? Boing! Uh, would you mind trying that? If you don't mind, I'd prefer to keep my singing voice a secret until the actual performance. <laughs> well, okay. Now we need three girls. And before there are any wisecracks, I'm one of the girls. <laughs> well, uh, can you boing, Miss Bankhead? With the best of them, though. <laughs> and now we need two more girls. Well, I'm a girl. <laughs> well, that's a nasty thing to say <laughs> Honest, I'm a girl Look, I'm wearing a dress Look, I'm wearing high heels Look, I'm wearing nylon stockings Look, I... You'll just have to take my word for it <laughs> well, Look, darling, can you boing, Joan? Are you kidding? Not in this girdle, no <laughs> Well, we need you, so stretch your point <laughs> Oh, and you, Vidalin, how about you? Can you boing? Well, boying has been rationed in England, you know, but I'll try it. Oh, well, don't be nervous, darling. Would you know, that's what I admire about you, Tallulah. You're never nervous or tense. Oh, well, I've been in this business too long. I'm past tense. <gasps> <laughs> you said it. I didn't. <laughs> Miss Bankhead... I've been looking around, and we're short one girl. One short girl? Oh, I know, Herb Schreiner. Would you mind being a short girl? All right. I'm prettier than most of the girls back home anyways, to tell you the truth. <laughs> That's the truth. I had one girl back there that I was trying to make a hit with, and uh, I took a picture of her in her bathing suit. I thought I'd send it to Miss America contest, you know, just to make a hit with her. You know, they sent that picture back. She didn't even get in the contest. In fact, they want to know how long she'd been in the water. <laughs> Red tape or something. <laughs> well, we're ready for the Boeing Quartet. Meredith Wilson and our guest soloist, Mr. Claude Rains, down by the old mill stream. Darlings, I hope you get a big Boeing out of it. <laughs> down. By the old mill stream. Bye bye. Where I first met you with your eyes. My village queen <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten Jack Queen My What's going on back there? Well, uh, Miss Bankhead, that's our salute to you. Because this past week, we noticed where the radio editors, editors of America 
through radio and TV daily, voted you Woman of the Year in radio. Uh, um. Well, that. Thank you, old darlings. That's a, a very great honor, Meredith, and I appreciate it so much. Thank you, radio editors of America. You're all my darlings. My darling, my darling, get used to the name of my darling. It's here That's a special chorus of thanks just for you, radio editors. And I sincerely hope I live up to your confidence. Thank you again. Next week, the big show will have, as its guests, Fred Allen, Tony Bennett, Phil Foster, June Havoc, Portland Hoffer, Betty Hutton, Vera Lynn, Shepard Strudwick, and others, and, of course, our very own Meredith Wilson and the big show orchestra and chorus. Until then, may the good Lord bless and keep you, whether near or far away, Vera. May you find that long-awaited golden day today. Joan. May your troubles all be small ones and your fortunes ten times ten. Claude. May the good Lord bless and keep you till we meet again, Jimmy. May you walk with sunlight shining and the bluebird in every tree, Danny. May there be a silver lining back of every cloud you see, Meredith. Fill your dreams with sweet tomorrows Never mind what might have been Herb May the good Lord bless and keep you Till we meet again Bob May you long recall each rainbow and you'll soon forget the rain. May the warm and tender moon. And God speed to our armed forces everywhere. Good night, darlings. That will Fill your dreams with sweet tomorrows. Never mind what mine. This portion of the big show has been brought to you by Chesterfield. Sound off for Chesterfield. Get something new, something no other cigarette has. Chesterfield mildness, plus no unpleasant aftertaste. By Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. And by Dentine, the gum with breathtaking flavor. And Beeman's Pepsin, the gum that's great to chew and good for your digestion, too. The first half hour of the big show is presented by the makers of Reynolds Aluminum, the Reynolds Metals Company, who also bring you the Kate Smith Evening Hour on the NBC Television Network. Herb Schreiner appears with the courtesy of Arrow Shirts. Enjoy mirth and music with Phil Harris and Alice Faye next on NBC.